I lose my marbles over a good board game, and when I was little, I loved Candyland. First made in the 1940s, the game has been a mega success, bringing generations of players through the Peppermint Forest and the Lollipop Woods. But the place where it was created wasn't fun at all. It was invented in a hospital. Hi, I'm Alec Belmore, and you're watching History and Intrigue. Around the turn of the 20th century, polio pandemics began to spread across Europe and Asia at an alarming rate. For most people, contracting the polio virus was manageable. It might last a few weeks and leave a sore throat, nausea, or a fever. But for about a half of 1% of people, still an incredible amount of people, it was much, much worse. When the disease enters the central nervous system, it can lead to weak muscles, even paralysis, especially in children. This can understandably lead to complications after it's run its course, like skeletal deformities or muscular deficiencies, in short, it's not fun. In 1948, Eleanor Abbott, a retired school teacher, was diagnosed with polio and had to spend some time in a San Diego hospital. Not every hospital had a polio ward, so often families would have to drive for hours for treatment if their child was struck with the disease. And often having work to return to, parents would leave their children alone there for days. So when Eleanor Abbott entered the hospital, she saw many children bedridden, sad, and lonely. And she had an idea, a game to help these poor kids pass the time. Taking a sheet of butcher's paper, she began to sketch what would become the game Candyland. The game was intended to be an antidote for the difficulties that polio presented. For children who couldn't leave their beds, the game offered the illusion of movement. It was kind of a wish-fulfillment thing. After being cooped up in a hospital, who wouldn't want to take a trip through a magical land made of candy? Early artwork for the game even depicted a boy in a lake brace. In 1949, Eleanor Abbott sold the game to Milton Bradley, who up to that point was best known for selling school supplies. The game became a mega success. Into the 1950s, children weren't allowed to go to places like public swimming pools or playgrounds for fear of spreading polio. Parents saw Candyland as a fitting alternative. The game required no reading and could be played alone, meaning parents were off the hook. Although a polio vaccine was invented in the 1950s and the disease was essentially eradicated by the 90s, Candyland has continued to be popular. Eleanor Abbott, in turn, decided to donate most of her royalties back to schools so they could buy new school supplies and equipment. Sometimes it's nice to know about nice people doing nice things. Although the gameplay has stayed the same, colored cards corresponding to colored spaces, some of the bells and whistles have changed. For example, at the game's launch, it was played with a pawn, but those were quickly replaced with little gingerbread men. The original game also didn't have any characters. Over the years, characters like Queen Frostine, the OG Elsa, and Lord Licorice, who they made far too hot, have been introduced. Honestly, your man looks at you like this, what are you doing? Speaking of which, in 1996, Hasbro, which purchased Milton Bradley, discovered that an adult website had purchased a URL containing Candyland. Fearing the sanctity of their brand, an injunction with the U.S. District of Washington was granted. There has been only one adaptation of the game, a 2005 straight-to-video release. There were talks for a live-action film starring Adam Sandler, but it fell through. But who knows, because the jerks in the Academy didn't give him a nod for Uncut Gems, he might make a really bad adaptation as revenge. The origin story of Candyland is unfortunately topical. If you're watching this sometime in the future, shit sucks right now. Most folks are stuck inside their homes while coronavirus pulls back the curtain and shows us what a precarious house of cards we've built for ourselves, culturally, politically, and economically. To be blunt, people are scared. But I like this story because it shows us in a pandemic how impactful an act of kindness or a kind thought can be even if it's as simple as thinking some sad kids should have something fun to do to pass the time. So talk to an old friend, check in on your neighbor. If you're able, see if someone nearby needs groceries or medicine that they can't go out and get on their own. If we look out for each other and all do our part, 
this thing might pass a little easier and a little sooner. Thanks for watching.